We'd like to welcome everyone to this gathering tonight. And Father God, first of all, I want to just thank you that uh, you know all things at all times. And I'm so grateful that you generously share with us in a very timely fashion those things that we need to know. And so I ask you to just guide me this night through this teaching as I speak to this people and we receive this word for this particular time. I thank you for this opportunity and I gratefully acknowledge uh, your power and your purpose in the name of Jesus. Uh, I'm going to start teaching from the book of Hosea tonight and uh, Hosea had a tough destiny. God uh, really declared that he should marry a wife that was unfaithful and we're not going to go through their stormy relationship and what they had to deal with, but really she was a depiction of the church who has a difficult time staying faithful to God, and that was really the whole point of his destiny, but that's not really where we're going tonight. Uh, I want to teach rather that uh, God knows all things at all times, past, present, and future, all the time, but I want to point out tonight that God is always, God is always going forward always moving forward. And God created us in His image, uh, so we should always be looking forward, uh, expecting, expecting forward movement. Yes. That, is our, that is our literal uh, uh, opportunity, is that we will move forward, it will happen. And so I want to teach about that just a little bit tonight from the book of Hosea, where we start in chapter 6 of the book of Hosea. And in fact, I think I'll start with the last verse of chapter 5 where God is saying, um, I will go away and return to my place. Now, I didn't know God had a place that he went, but evidently he does. And so this location, he says, I will go away and return to my place until they, speaking of the church, his, his people, Israel, until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So God had confidence they would eventually call upon him. He said, but until then, I'm going to go to my place and wait. And so then chapter 6 begins, and the response to God's rebuke is this. The people begin to say, come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So their desire now and their decision was to seek the Lord, knowing that God would make things right for them. And then in verse number three, this is the critical verse for this beginning tonight. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord his going forth is as certain as the dawn. So God moves forward as surely as the sun comes up every morning. The future begins every day, and that's another incremental movement forward into the eastern, eastern movement under the glory of God. So here it's, it says unequivocally that God's going forth is as certain as the dawn. Uh, now I love that because the way I understand the Bible, if God moves forward as as a uh, uh, consistently as the dawn, I'm in God, that means I'm also moving forward. And I need to be aware of how he's doing this. Where is he going? What's he going to do? What's my part? And so this is really what they were saying. So let us know. Let us know. And let us press on to know the Lord. Because he's always moving forward. And the inference there also is, I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to still be here and he's moved on forward. And so I see the, uh, uh, that similarity of some of our situations right now that God is literally moving forward and we want to move forward with him. It's always been that way in uh, Genesis chapter 2. And it says in verse number 8, this is after God had created a, the physicality of a human being in the earth realm. And in Genesis 2 and verse 8 it says, And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east. So again, an opportunity to move forward into the future. Eastward, God uh, planted uh, a garden uh, toward the east, toward the future in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So he gave man a point of beginning to move forward. And I want us to understand tonight, God has placed you at a point of beginning. And we have begun, 
And now we're going to continue to move forward eastward into the provision that God's already put before us as we continue to go forward eastward. That future provision will always be there when we need it. So that's one place. And then if you look in Exodus, Exodus chapter number 14, here the children of Israel had finally been uh, delivered from Egypt and now they're moving on and they're, they're having a difficulty they didn't expect. The Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army bearing down on them from behind. And so in Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 13, But Moses said to the people, Do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. <clears throat> now, we read that hundreds of times probably. But let me just say this. They were in a situation that was real. And they thought they were going to lose their lives. And they did not see a way out. And yet Moses said, just, just uh, believe uh, that God's going to do. You don't see it. But Moses said, I want you to know something. Deal with the fear factor first. Don't be afraid. It looks impossible. We don't see a way out. But he says, I want you to hear this day. Stand by and see. He says, all you have to do is hold your ground. Uh, don't give way. Don't go backwards. Don't go laterally. Just stay where you are. And God is going to come, and he's going to do something that will pr produce salvation for you. And he says, I will accomplish for it for you today. Now, again, they had to come into their understanding. Oh, he said it's going to be today, but it hasn't happened yet. Oh, it's going to be today. But he's, uh, he, he said, today will happen. He had to bring them to the point of believing this is the transition point. This is the point of inflection when it really does change. Believe what I'm telling you, Moses was saying. The Lord, he says, he will accomplish for you today, for the Egyptians, for this problem that you've been seeing that's bearing down on you even harder than ever before. The problem you're seeing today, you will never see it again in your future. You get past this, and that problem will never be in your life again. And so this is a good word for all of us, and I'm receiving this word. This, this is something that God is making a, a promise, a, a pledge to these people. If you'll just stand your ground, you're going to see this enemy disappear, and you'll never see this problem again. And then he says, here's why. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Just hold your ground. Hold your tongue. Don't speak negatively like it hasn't happened yet. I don't know if God's going to do it or not. Just be quiet. And then there was one more step involved because God said to Moses in the next verse, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Now see, that takes a big leap of faith. They didn't see how they could possibly move forward. And yet God was saying, come on, do what I'm telling you to do, and it, what looks impossible now, there's going to be a freeing up of, a, of an ability to move that you don't recognize in your situation right now. But I'm going to, God says, I'm going to do something that you don't expect, and that very thing that's been holding you back, the opposition that's prevented you from going forward, I'm going to change that. And so all you have to do is just stand there, be quiet, and watch, and get ready to move forward. And that's the point. I believe with all of my heart, I was talking to Connie about this even tonight, in my spirit, it's chaotic, it seems to get worse every day, when's this ever going to change? But I said, in my spirit, I cannot help but believe we're so close to a different arena of reality that I've never experienced before. It's in my spirit. I, I teach it, I believe it, I'm ready to uh, experience it, but I believe that God is going to do this, and I don't know how he's going to do it. I've said that to God many, many times. God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I can't wait to see how you did. And that's where I am. That's where you are and a lot of other people as well. So the point there is, though, God says the main point is I'm going to make a way. Your part is to move forward. When I give you a space to move into, move there. And then and one other place about that, because we're like God, we're all supposed to always be looking forward, moving forward. And when they finally did cross over uh, into the promised land, we find in Joshua there were situations that had to be dealt with and and of course the one that we all can draw to mind very quickly is when they came to Jericho a mighty city and uh, they were supposed to do what they were told and God would take care of that situation as well because 
It was a, an obstacle that was preventing them from taking possession of something that God has said it belongs to you. I hope we're hearing that. There's things that God has told you, this belongs to you. Something's preventing you from possessing it. But listen to my instructions and you will take possession of that new territory, that new property, whatever it might be. God says, I'm going to let you have what I promised you you would have, even though it doesn't look like you can ever achieve that because the walls are too big, they're too thick. We can't go over them, we can't go through them, but God says, watch this. And you know the story, they followed the instructions, marching around Jericho, but we come to chapter uh, 6 of Joshua and verse number 20. When the process came to a point of fruition, Joshua 6, 20, so the people shouted, and uh, priests blew the trumpets, and it came about when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, that the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down. And the wall fell down, just like another day in God's uh, providence, uh, the wall fell down. That wall that was preventing me from moving forward, suddenly that wall's not there anymore. It was that instantaneous, and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, moving forward, and they took the city. So here's the deal. God is going to let you see something that seems like it will never give way. In a moment of time, it's going to be gone. In a moment of time, it's going to change. What was constricting your movement is going to be no more. If God has to, he will vaporize it. It will be gone. And I'm just saying... The point of it is God wants you to expect forward movement. And he wants you to be ready for that even now. Out of different dilemmas and thought process, it's time to move forward out of a lot of categories. A lot of categories. So anyway, that's the truth. God always moves forward. He wants it to be, us to be ready to move forward. But here's what I would say also at this juncture, throughout history, and we're up to this point in time, the church, as I think we all can agree at different levels and degrees. The church has been as though it's been dead in many ways. And that is, of course, diametrically opposite of the believer's true status. The Bible lets us know that we are nowhere near being dead. And so I just want to touch on that just a little bit in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, because the church is not dead, but it's been acting like it's dead. And I want to get into that just a little bit tonight, because that dynamic is about to change as well. I really believe that. But in Ephesians uh, chapter number 1 and uh, verse number 19, the Word of God says, And what is the surpassing greatness of God's power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Verse 20 says, Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And I want to, make, I want to reference that. We're about to move into the full-blown kingdom age. So this power will be absolutely evident in the kingdom age like never before. And it goes on to say not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he, God, put all things in subjection under the feet of Christ and gave Jesus Christ as the head over all things to the ecclesia, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now drop down to chapter 2 and verse number 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, spiritually dead, in our transgressions, he made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us in him in the heavenly places in Christ. The point being, we are not supposed to be expressing that we're dead, but rather that we're resurrected and we're alive. We are supposed to be exemplary of resurrection power. Jesus was raised from the dead, and God was able to call him his son with power because of the resurrection. You are called a son of God with power because of the resurrection. 
the resurrection power of God. So the church, in my estimation, it's now time that we take our true status as believers and let the world know that we're alive, that we are absolutely a, a, in a opposition to the current cancel culture, and we're about to manifest the kingdom culture of the living God. So I say to you tonight, in, from my perspective, and I, you have your opinion as well, and I understand that, but here's what I would say. It appears to me, it appears to me, that the church needs not only a great awakening, which we do, but we also need a great resurrection. We need to come to compliance with the reality. I'm alive in the spirit. I'm not dead. I'm alive. And we need to come to that, uh, that understanding and uh, begin to move and operate in that realm of reality. So let's go there just for a little while. I love this scripture I'm about to give you. I don't think I've ever taught from this before in my entire life. I'm about to give it a shot tonight in the presence of you, my friends, thank God, <laughs> friends. <laughs> but I'm so grateful that God lets me teach his word. I can't emphasize that enough. I, I, I feel so honored that God lets me teach his word. And so here in Isaiah uh, chapter 26, I want to look at this just a little bit with you tonight because in Isaiah 26 and uh, verse number 16, it says, O Lord, they sought you in distress. They could only whisper a prayer. Your chastening was upon them. So these people are in a dilemma. Evidently, had gotten a little bit away from the Lord and they're, all they can do is whisper to God, please help me. I, I need help. So this is where we see that scenario. The next verse says, they're beginning to confess their uh, inferiority of success because it says next, verse 17, as the pregnant woman approaches the time to give birth, she writhes and cries out in her labor pains. Thus were we before you, O Lord. We were pregnant. We writhed in labor. We gave birth as it were only to wind. We could not accomplish deliverance for the earth, nor were inhabitants of the world born. I want to just give you insight that I believe is scripturally accurate. That's talking about these people had not been able to birth because it wasn't time yet for one thing, but they were not yet able to bring forth the inhabitants of the spiritual Israel. They were not able to bring forth spiritual Israel yet. They've been trying they had birth pangs. They're trying to do the best they can, but nothing has really come to pass that God wants to be brought into the earth realm. The time was not yet right. But I say to you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the time is now right. And we're seeing the birthing. We're seeing the birthing of the spiritual Israel. Those are to be becoming a part of the family of God, the sons of God. And that's what they were crying out to be done. But then the next scripture says, your dead will live. There will be resurrection power. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. In other words, there's going to be like a supernatural dew that's going to settle on the graves of those that need to come forth. Amen. The graves of your goals and your aspirations, your dreams that seem to be buried. But God says a supernatural dew is going to arrive on the scene. And the Lord said it's time for birthing of spiritual Israel and the provision that spiritual Israel has coming to them and is going to come forth under the glory of God for your dew is as the dew of the dawn. There it is, a new day moving forward, a new day moving forward. Look forward tomorrow for some supernatural moisture to fall in your territory, something that will cause things to grow that seem like they were dead and gone forever. But I see the word is saying that's not the case at all. It says, uh, do as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits, departed dreams and goals, aspirations, all of these things. And then the next word says, since we now believe this is going to happen because of the chaos in the earth, come my people, enter into your, into your rooms, your chambers, close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place. He said, I'm going to my place. 
But now he says, I'm coming out of my place. It's time for me to now move into the future of what I have in the earth realm to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. I'm telling you tonight, as I'm being led by the Holy Spirit, God is about to bring forth your spiritual dreams and goals and aspirations like never before. A supernatural dew from on high is about to come into your territory and new life will prevail. You're going to see things come forth that you thought you might ever, never see again. Take it to Ezekiel, the obvious place. Ezekiel chapter 37. And let's look at that just very briefly tonight. Because Ezekiel 37, the first... Uh, Ten verses, God is challenging Ezekiel. Uh, do you think these bones can live? It's a valley of dry bones, very dry. Been dead for a long time. Dreams and aspirations. The framework is there, but nothing is on it. It's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. My goals are gone and dead. And God says, can these bones live? And uh, Ezekiel said, I don't know. You do, Lord. Let me know. Can they? And God let him know, if you'll prophesy to them, they will. If you'll speak word of life to them, they will. If you haven't given up on them, says God, I haven't. Come on, somebody. If, if, if I haven't given up on them, says God, the only thing left to be done is that you haven't given up on them. And if you'll prophesy, if you'll speak life to them, they will live. And so it goes through that whole uh, uh, story that we know so very well. He prophesied, the bones came together, uh, flesh on the bones, and it was made as it should be. But the point I want to get to in that particular narrative is down at verse number 11, when God says very clearly, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, the spiritual house of Israel. Jew, Gentile, we are all of one family. And it says these are... Uh, the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. That's the word we need to take right now. God has spoken it and God does not leave anything he speaks undone, unfinished. I have spoken it. And I have done it, says the Lord. So, again, a new flavor of looking at Romans 4, 17, where Abram believed in the God who gives life to dead things and calls things that are not as though they were. And I take that to you tonight as well. We need to understand that you have been given the capacity of faith to literally see things be resurrected. Uh, things that are dead come to life. Uh, things that uh, you haven't seen, but yet they exist anyway, materialize and come into reality. So tonight I say that we believe God and His resurrection power. His resurrection power, His redemptive power. He's going to bring everything around to where it's living and breathing. It's the perfect example of what God has called you to produce in the earth realm. It's not going to be some dry, weed-infested field. It's going to be a field of fruitfulness under the glory of God. A, a maga, all kinds of fruit. You can't even imagine it. It's going to be that kingdom age is upon us in the name of the Lord. So tonight I encourage you. In this teaching, in fact, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it's really a narrative in the form of an encouraging word. And we're going to go through just a little bit of this tonight. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, the beginning part of that is talking about uh, Paul's, I've been through some things, I've been comforted, so therefore I'm supposed to comfort you. That's the basic narrative to begin with. You move on down to verse number 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And it says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively, 
beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. See, you see how this is begin, is falling right into place. We felt like we were going to die. It's almost like all we wanted to do was die, and yet we do. The reason for that is so that God can prove through me resurrection power. And I find ourselves in that case as well. It goes on to say in verse 10, he, who, who did deliver us? Who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us? He on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. I'm saying tonight, God has put us in situations at times when it looks like everything is dead and gone. All I want to do is curl up and die. But this says, if I will just bring into my understanding, God gives life to things that are dead. He calls things to life that are dead. And he said that he did it then, he'll do it now, and he'll do it in the future. He's the one that we've set our hope on. He's the one that's going to do this. God is the one that's going to produce this resurrection power. And all I have to do is believe it applies to my situation also. Philippians 3 Paul put it this way. In Philippians 3, Paul put it in these wonderful, wonderful phrases, these words in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, that's Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Okay, let me stop. There. I'm going to finish that, but you cannot experience resurrection power unless something is first dead. So many of us are in a very good situation right now. He goes on to say, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. In other words, I want to understand it so I can begin to experience it. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on. I go forward. I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward, reaching into the future to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly where we find ourselves tonight. We are... Thank God forever. Hallelujah. I'm in a position where I need some dead things to come to life. Therefore, I want to experience that. Therefore, I'm not going to grumble. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to press into the power of God and his resurrection in Jesus' name because I want to become an example. I want to have testimony. I want to have evidence of what God can do when things like they're dead and gone, but God brings them back in the name of the Lord. That's where we are in the name of Jesus. Forgive me all of y'all out there, but I love God so much that he's about to cause something to come back to life in my life that I thought was dead. Something is coming back. Tomorrow, the dew of the dawn will bring it to pass. That being the case, and it is, we're not dead, we're alive. We understand then if we really believe that we've been raised with Jesus Christ and are seated with him in heavenly places, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, then you need to begin to look at the things that are above. Seek the things that are above. Don't look at the things below, but seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things above. The things that are already established in a different realm of time and space that God created at the foundation of the world that location of time and space is referred to by many titles. One is the glory realm from which all of your needs are met by the, the riches of Christ Jesus in the glory realm. That's where it is, and you're going to call it forth under the glory of God in Jesus' name, resurrection power. So we're to that point. Now, so I look forward to the great resurrection. I believe that's happening in many of our lives even now. Then there will be this great awakening. That does make sense, Lord. Thank you. You can't come awake unless you're alive. 
So I got to be resurrected first in my spirit. I got to understand. Then I can become awake. I'm alive. That's established. Now I'm going to come awake. And so we take that word from Psalm 78. Again, we're just like God, made in his image and in his likeness. We're not God, but we're created in his image and in his likeness. Therefore, the characteristics of God we can also emulate. We can be like him. So in Psalm 78, Psalm 78, we look here at this wonderful representation. Now we know that this is a, God never sleeps. We know that, okay? We know that. Not in a, real, not in a natural. So we know that God never sleeps, but yet it says here in uh, Psalm 78 and verse number 65. So what I'm about to give you right now is figurative. It's a comparative. Okay, uh, Psalm 78 verse 65. The Lord awoke. God never sleeps, but this is a comparative. The Lord awoke as if from a sleep. Didn't say he was sleeping, but it's like he had been sleeping. It's, he says he awoke as if from sleep, like a warrior overcome by wine, and he drove his adversaries backward. He put on them an everlasting reproach. Therefore, there is now God who is now awake. I believe he is. Things are happening that we're not aware of. But God says, I want you to be just like me. I want you to come awake. And so we take that as God wants us to take it, I believe, tonight. And we move over to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. And in that particular chapter, in verse number 13, it says again, The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. I want, uh, I, that is the, that's the level of expectation we should have right now. He's awake. He's like a warrior. He's had enough. He says, I'm going to move right now. And he's going to come with a shout, a war cry, and he will prevail against his enemies. That's exactly what he's going to do. So now, we need to, in like manner, put forth God-like action. God is awake like a warrior, causing the enemy to take flight in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 Verse 11, and this do knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. So the time is now to be awake, be alert. And then it goes forward and it really compares God being a mighty warrior because it says next, the night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Like a warrior, we need to armor up. We need to be awake and alert. And we need to be ready, armored up, ready for action. Do what God, we need to, God is about to move forward like a warrior. And we need to follow him forward like warriors. With that advancement of taking back territory, taking back goals and dreams. That's because of a warrior, a warrior mentality. It's God like action. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, verse 13. But all things become visible when they're exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead. Awake, sleeper, there's that comparative, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is an important portion of scripture that I've taught from. I still don't have the fullness of it, but I do know that when we are awake, we're not dead anymore. There's going to be a supernatural illumination, and we're going to see things that we could not see before. And we're going to be able to respond in like manner, something we don't even know exists, either to possess it or resist it. But we're going to see it and know it because everything exposed to the light is light, and it says that's why we need to be awake, and Christ is going to shine on us, 
the elucidation of the holy God that we serve is going to shine on us and Christ will shine on us so that we might move forward unto the glory of God. Does it not take you immediately, and I'm sure many of you it does, to Isaiah chapter 60, does it not? That probably took you right there, that thought, because again it says in Isaiah 60 and verse number 1, Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Again, some of that which I've just taught is relevant here. First of all, you can't arise and shine unless you're awake. And you can't be awake unless you're alive. And now that you're, now that you're alive and awake, you rise and you shine, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you as an individual. It's talking about the Christ, I know that, but we're the extension of the Christ. We get to have the same attributes and characteristics and, and an enablement that he has. For as he is, so are we in the earth. And it goes on to say, for, for behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. And nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. We've had a plethora of teaching from those scriptures. That's about the Christ. But we are the extension of the Christ. These words apply to us. We're to rise and shine in the glory that God established for us before the foundation of the world, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. A glory that was put in place for us before the foundation of the world. And we begin to walk in it under the glory of God. Why? So that we're in a well-lit environment, the wonderful, unapproachable light of God is, is enlightening the darkest recesses of our territory, and we're able to move forward with confidence and power like a warrior, take control, take possession, drive out, and receive. Hallelujah unto God. So here we see this is even now happening, I believe. So resurrection, awakening, then kingdom age, restoration, manifestation. After resurrection and awakening, we begin to manifest kingdom reality in the kingdom age. Isaiah 61, again, referring to the Christ prophetically, but we are the extension of the Christ. It says in verse 1 of Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I proclaim this the favorable year of the Lord. I declare it now in the name of Jesus, the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance. See, the, compared to God, God has a year of favor, only a day of vengeance. Thank God. That's his, that's his uh, balance, uh, uh, a year of favor, but only a day of vengeance. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God. Comparatively, there's a big difference. To comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then... Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. That is the reconfiguration of the earth realm under the glory of God, bringing it into the final form, the eternal form of King Jesus sitting on his throne in the, in the new earth, on his throne in the new earth in New Jerusalem, and we rule and we reign forever and ever with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But I say this to you tonight. Here is my impression of what we should be accepting as our now dynamic. Jesus taught it in John chapter 4, verse 34. Some guys came back after having lunch and they asked Jesus if he's hungry. In John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So he said, my focus is finishing my destiny. Do not Say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. And already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for the life eternal that he who sows and he who reaps 
may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. That's restoring the generations of devastation, anointings of generations. And Jesus is saying you need to recognize that's now. Yes, it's bringing in those that are unconverted into the kingdom, accepting Christ. Of course it is. But it's also bringing forth the fruit of eternal life, the fruit of the kingdom. Kingdom fruit, you bring it forth like unto the glory of God, and the, the harvest is now available. Kingdom age is upon us to begin to bring in the kingdom fruit. The kingdom fruit is very much an imperative of we who love the Lord. In fact, Jesus said in one place, I'm going to take the kingdom dynamic away from you people and give it to those who are bringing forth the fruit of the kingdom. I'm going to change the dynamic. And we're ready for that. Under the glory of God, generational harvest, kingdom fruit, because of resurrection power, and that we are awake and we're moving forward under the glory of God. So I'm going to bring this last part of this teaching. This is the culmination of the teaching because with all of that having been said, there will inevitably be a restoration to original intent of the spiritual Israel of God back to the original intent that God had from the very beginning. Amos chapter number 9. Amos chapter 9 and verse number 11. In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David, the fallen tabernacle of David, and I will wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, as in the vanishing point of eternity past, in original intended form. Eternity past, alam in Hebrew, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name. That's spiritual Israel, Jew and Gentile, all nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. It's going to happen. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. When the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. I love that phraseology. That says very much that all of the barren and unfruitful places will melt together and begin to overflow with spiritual blessing. That's what that says. They're all going to come together in an amalgam of the blessings of God. It's going to flow like a river, like the oil of God. It's going to be like that. And he says, verse 14, And I will also restore the fortunes of my people, spiritual Israel. God says, I will do that. This is the culmination of the mystery of God. It's all fulfilled. He said, I will restore the captivity or the fortunes of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities, Isaiah 61, Romans chapter 8, reconfiguring earth realm. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. Okay, which city do I want, Lord? Well, I've always liked Nashville. Just a stupid interjection, but I'm just saying. He says, you'll rebuild cities and live in them. That's very, very straightforward. Then the final verse tonight, and I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. Give God praise. Amen. God bless you tonight. Thank you.
I'm speaking this this evening out of Genesis chapter 14 and taking my text from verse 13 when it talks about Abraham and do you remember how Abraham and Lot he had Lot was his nephew and Lot was taken captive by the um, when they had a uh, a bunch of kings came up against the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot you remember lived at Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham and and Lot split Abraham said I'll go this way you go that or I'll go this way and you go that and they divided the land and Lot saw the area of Sodom and Gomorrah that it was a very pleasant valleys and well watered and he's like I want that area and it put put him right over next to and into Sodom and Gomorrah which is a very evil town but he lived there not one of his better moves and one day four or five kings come up against Sodom and Gomorrah and they are going to take Sodom and Gomorrah and they do they basically attack and carry away all the stuff out of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot in the net he goes with them well word gets back to Abraham and he's like not on my watch we're going after him so he gathers his 300 servants this is verse 14 when Abraham heard that his brother had been taken captive he armed his trained servants born in his own house 318 men and he pursued them even unto Dan. Dan was way north in uh, the land of Israel. And he divided himself against them, against the army, he and his servants by night. And they smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left-hand side of Damascus. So they attacked him at night, him and his 300 servants his employees they all went up and he they surrounded them and attacked them at midnight and drove the enemy out and rescued lot and he brought back verse 16 all the goods and also brought against his brother lot and his and his goods and the women also and the people so he rescued everything that lot had all of his family all of the everything that had been taken abraham got it back and verse 17 says and the king of sodom remember they he just taken everything of 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 the king of sodom's possessions had been stolen and so now the king of sodom goes out to him because he got all of his stuff back and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, which is the, one of the evil kings that had attacked. So they killed Chedorlaomer and of the other kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is in the king's dale. Verse 18, and Melchizedek, this, this, other, this other individual also goes out to meet Abraham. And Melchizedek is the priest of the Most High God. He's the king of Salem, which we believe to be Jerusalem. So he's the, he's the king of, and Salem, shalom, shalom means peace. So you have Melchizedek, who is the priest of the Most High God. He's, he comes out to meet Abraham after he returns from the slaughter of the kings. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. So he's coming out to meet Abraham. He's got food. He's got wine. He's, he's coming out to bless Abraham. Because you've got to realize Abraham is in partnership with God. Remember how God said, I'm going to bless you, and everything that you do is going to be blessed? You can see how God, he goes up against four kings, and with 300 men he whips these other kings and brings all the stuff back and so this the king of Sodom goes out to talk to him and and also um, the priest of the Mo, most high God Melchizedek king of Salem also goes out and verse 19 this is uh, Genesis chapter 4 
13, verse 19, and Melchizedek speaks a blessing over Abraham. It says, and Melchizedek blessed Abram. And he said, he, so he comes out as he's returning from this battle, and he proclaims a blessing over Abraham, a, over Abram. And he says, blessed be Abraham of the most high God. He is a possessor of heaven and earth. So here you see him proclaiming a blessing over Abram and saying, Abraham and God are partners. And he declares he's a priest, and a priest is one that talks to both man and he talks to God. So here you have Melchizedek declaring a blessing over Abraham, saying, blessed be Abraham, possessor of heaven and earth. He had power with God. Because of his relationship with God, he was, Melchizedek spoke over him that he was a possessor of heaven and earth. How do you possess both heaven and earth? Be the friend of God. When you be the friend of God, God owns heaven. God owns the earth. And when you are the friend of both, you are can work in both the realms of the earth as well as the realm of heaven. So he declares over him, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he also, and blessed be the Most High God. Not only does he speak a blessing over Abram, but he says, And blessed be Jehovah God, Abraham's God. So, so he's blessing both the man and the God as he speaks. He declares a blessing. He said, Blessed be God, which, who hath delivered your enemies into your hand. So it was, he, he's showing you behind the scenes. It was God that gave him the victory. He said, you, you whipped him with 300 men. That's because God Stack the deck. It was like Pastor Ron was talking about when, when you go around when you go around Jericho and the wall falls down, it wasn't because how you walked. It was because God knocked the walls down. You were just obedient. God did the heavy lifting. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, Abram, gave Melchizedek a tithe of all that he had. So here you see, remember Jacob said, if you'll be faithful and bring me back in peace, I'll give you, of everything I get, I'll give you a tenth. This is his grandpa, Granddaddy Abram. He probably told um, Isaac and then subsequently Jacob you know, whenever you have a major victory, you need to give the tithe to God. Here he's coming back with all the loot, and he's give, he's, he gives him a tithe of all into the hands of Melchizedek, who's an emissary for God himself. He's showing that relationship. He's showing when I have a victory, I don't squander it on myself. I give back into the kingdom of God. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram. Now, here's the king of Sodom. Remember, the place was vile. They had to actually do uh, brimstone. God had to rain fire and brimstone from heaven to burn it off the deal. And this is the king. So he was not a cherub. He was not a saintly person. Okay, And he comes up to Abraham. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons. In other words, give me my people back that they, that they took, all my wives and kids and all the people that, they, that, the, that the kings took when they ravaged this place. Just I want them back. He says, but you can have all the stuff. So he tries to give Abram some of the booty. And listen in verse 22 what Abram says. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, he declares, he said, King, 
He said, I have made a promise to my God. I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord. Whenever you lift up your hand, it's like saying, I pledge, I, I, I swear on a stack of Bibles, you know, I will tell the whole truth. It's that same thing. I have lifted my hand before God as God is my witness. I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God. And here's what I promised him. Here's what I've sw sworn to him. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. Now here you see that same thing again. Melchizedek referred to Abram as the possessor of heaven and earth. Here, Abram is saying, well, God is really the possessor of heaven and earth. Of course, we're tight. But you see that God is the one that really owns heaven and earth. But when you're in covenant with him, you are the one that can walk in the heavenly places. In Zechariah, it talks about if you'll walk before me blameless, if you'll keep yourself pure, it says, then you can walk in the heavenly places. You can walk in the heavenly areas, and you can walk among the heavenly cloud of witnesses up in the, up in the throne room is, is what the inference is. It's in Zechariah chapter 2. You have power in heaven and on earth when you walk in the realms of God. He said, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that, here's the promise, that I will not take from a thread. He says, I don't want a thread that you give me, king. No, no offense against you, king, but I don't, I've made a promise to God that only God is going to make me wealthy, is what he's saying. He said, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord that I will not take a thread or even a shoe latchet. I don't even want the latchet of a shoe where you could say, hey, I gave Abraham that on his shoe. He, does, he said, I don't want anything you've got. I appreciate it, but I've made a promise to God that it's just between me and God, and I don't want any tainted money. I don't want any... Anything that's going to, so you can turn around later on and say, it was because I helped Abraham. That's how come he's so rich. He says, I don't want anything from you. I will not take a thread even to a shoe, shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is thine, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. He said, only God is going to bless me. I'm not going to take a little here, a little there, so I can get ahead in life. Only God. Now, do you do you see why God blessed him? This is the kind of this is the kind of integrity he said. I don't want a thing that you've got. He said the only thing that we're going to receive is is what the young men have eaten. Uh, the food that they've eaten, they can have that, and the portions of the men that went with me, if, if, if some of the guys got some stuff, that's their business, um, they can take their portion. But as for me, I don't want a thing. And he goes back to his, he goes back to his home, blessed. But you see here that when he, when he had the victory, the point I want to bring out this evening is that when he had the victory, he knew where his victory had come from. And when we have our victories, we don't need to act like it was us and that we're all that good at whatever we've done. We need to say it was the Lord's doing. We need to keep ourselves humble. We need to keep ourselves pure. And we need to say, Lord, it's you that is causing us to prosper. It is you that is causing us to become blessed in the land. You are the one that possesses heaven and earth, and we, because of our affiliation with you, also possess heaven and earth. Amen? Amen. So I will close with that. Amen. Let's take up our evening offering.
Heavenly Father God, we thank you that you are always faithful. And truly, Father, you are the possessor of heaven and earth. And we, because we are your children, we are also possessors of heaven and earth. And Father God, we thank you, God of the heavens and God of the earth, that you are faithful and that you are going before us. And as Ron was, was, was preaching, that Father God, you are making a way where there seems no way. And you are causing us, Father God, to go only forward and not backward. You're causing life, Father God, to come and in replace every death and replace every despondency. You are the author of life. And Father God, we are your children. We expect good things as we go forward. And Father God, we know that you have great things in store for us. And so, Father, we are very expectant that you will do even greater things than we could even imagine. So, Father, as we start in this new chapter of our of Spirit of Life's ministry, we pray your blessing on this place. We pray your blessing upon our people. We pray your blessing, Father God, as we, as we search out what you would have to be done. We pray that you would lead us and guide us in your way. And, Father God, that you would cause us to prosper in the land. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>